Greetings. Mark Boswell here with Boswell Emergency Medical Education Technology. What we're going to do with this episode of our of the video broadcast is go over maxillofacial ENT and some ocular emergencies for the CEN exam. We're going to start with pharyngitis, which is a pretty common cause for ER visits. Basically, this is your sore, sore throat presentation. If you look in the slide here, you can see how the throat is red, irritated. Commonly, this is just due to a viral infection causing some inflammation. And its transmission is by droplets, so patients need to be educated about coughing, sneezing, covering their mouth and nose, and frequent hand washing. The patient will typically complain of a mild, medium sore throat. Sometimes it hurts to swallow. And the pain may even refer to the ears, the neck, or the jaw. If they're really sick, they may also have some of their viral symptoms too, with fevers, chills, and body aches. The physical exam, you'll probably notice some congestion, maybe fever. The tonsils may be enlarged. Now, in the picture I showed you, the tonsils aren't particularly enlarged. It's just reddened in the back area there. We don't see the tonsils sticking out. But they may or not, may not be enlarged. We may find some lymph nodes. Those are those swollen glands under their uh, neck, under their chin under their jaw. Now, interventions and treatment may be a throat culture. Uh, if they're really sick looking, maybe some basic laboratories, maybe a monospot or the monoscreen, looking to see if we differentiate between Epstein-Barr virus versus just a routine uh, viral pharyngitis. Medications, now if we're convinced it's not an infectious uh, as far as bacterial goes, basically it's just symptomatic treatment, over-the-counter non-steroidals, Advil, Aleve, ibuprofen, things like that. Maybe some of those sore throat lozenges also. Now, sometimes if the pain is really severe, we might consider doing something like some steroids to help suppress the inflammation, which is causing such distress and discomfort to the patient. And that's a frequent treatment we'll use. It's like a Decadron injection or Depomedrol or whatever your practitioner is using. Now, if we think that the uh, pharyngitis is actually a bacterial infection, specifically strep throat, then we'll probably consider prescribing some antibiotics. We've got a couple different options. We may use the penicillin injection, uh, benzathine penicillin. That's that white, thick, milky-looking one-time injection we give. And basically, it's designed to last in the body for several days to continue to um, penetrate the tissues and to kill off the infecting organisms. If we put them on something by mouth, it's going to be typically a 10-day course of uh, penicillin or penicillin-type medicine. And if they're penicillin allergic, we can use azithromycin or the Z-Pak or Zithromax is appropriate also. And this picture here is showing you how the tonsils are definitely enlarged and we start to see the, the pus and the infection draining from the tonsils there. Teaching points for home care for both infections, whether it be uh, strep or just virus, warm saline gargles, good hand washing, cover the mouth and nose, and basically want to decrease the chance of transmitting throughout the family. Moving over to epistaxis, which is our emergency nosebleed condition, most causes that present to the ER, or I'm sorry, most causes, that, these ones don't always present, but the most commonplace is an area called Kesselbox plexus, which if you look in this slide picture there, it's outlined for you with the blue circle. And this is basically where a, a large amount of that network of those um, of the vascular bed overlaps, and it's particularly prone to some trauma in that area. Less often we can get... An, we can get more of a posterior nosebleed back in the posterior compartment. Let me outline that for you. The posterior compartment will be more back in this area here. And we've got more of a high flow arterial type blood flow in that area. So it's more profound, more profuse bleeding. And sometimes can go unnoticed if a lot of it ends up going down the throat here or the patient swallows a lot of it. They may not notice it at first. But most cases will be anterior um, from that Kesselbox plexus. And there's many different causes, anything from trauma to upper respiratory infections to foreign bodies in the nose. Um, sometimes just routine uh, small bleeding may be made worse if the patient's on antiplatelets or things like Coumadin or other blood thinners. Now, the treatments, um, if it's an anterior bleed, which again is the more common one that actually happens, but they don't always come into the ER because a lot of times this is taken care of at home. But if it's anterior, um, basically direct pressure is what we want. Um, to teach the patient to pinch the nostrils for 10 to 30 minutes, and 30 minutes is a long time. If that's unresponsive, we can try doing things uh, with some uh, topical decongestants or vasoconstrictors, like Afrin nasal spray is a strong vasoconstrictor, which may slow down the bleeding, or maybe that silver nitrate. Those long Q-tip looking sticks that actually cause a mild chemical burn to actually seal off the blood vessels. And sometimes we'll pack the anterior 
nose blades if necessary using one of the two methods shown here, either that nasal tampon on the left or the rhino rocket or its equivalent on the right side. Either one is a good option. Now, if it's a posterior bleed back in that um, more highly vascular network, typically those ones will always have to be packed because it's hard to get control of the bleeding back there. Now, there's not really any testing we're going to do unless we need to rule in or rule out a specific condition or look for some complication or uh, maybe if the patient's having severe bleeding. So laboratory test as indicated, also CT if indicated. Uh, if we're suspicious for some type of tumor or mass, or if there's some history of we know the patient's got a pre-existing condition which can potentiate this, we might need to consider that. Odontalgia is the fancy word basically for toothache or dental pain, and most common causes will be a cavity or some break of the of the dental protective coverings and the the dent the dentin itself, causing exposure of the nerve tissue and the pulp to air pathogens causing pain. And this could be a sudden onset or it could be gradual. The patient may have already had a low-level pain for a long time before they came to ED. Pain could radiate to the side of the face, the jaw, the neck. Now, untreated, the cavity, of course, could enlarge, cause more problems, more discomfort, and can possibly lead to abscess formation if the bacteria actually colonizes down inside the living tissue there. Typically, we'll, we'll prescribe antibiotics and, and pain medicines, and we're going to require or educate the patient about some type of dental follow-up for a full dental assessment and any um, additional treatments is needed like fillings or uh, other type of dental work. A dental abscess, it could be its own problem or it could be an extension of a pre-existing cavity or some other dental problem that started. But basically now the, uh, the opening has been made through the tooth or through the supporting structures, and pathogens have colonized the soft tissue down either the nerve root or the jaw area. Patients will complain of some pain, some facial swelling. Uh, when you see the patient, you may notice one side pr pronounced swell, swollen. You might notice it be hot and red, basically like an abscess um, presentation. They may be fevers and chills, may have a very uh, strong, pungent, or fetid, which means infected, smell to their breath. And the lab tests for this are going to be, again, specific to the patient and their situation, um, how sick do they look, how, much, how worried are we about this abscess extending into the neck or into the sinuses or into some other soft tissue area there. The treatment, the definitive treatment would be incision and drainage. Typically, I, my personal experience, I've not seen a lot of these IND or lanced in the ED setting. Usually we've treated them with antibiotics, and then if it was that severe, we got ENT to come and see them. Uh, we're treating the infection, however, with some type of uh, antibiotics, usually a parenteral route to get more of a penetration or a build up the plasma level, and of course, some pain medicines will also. Now, the disposition is going to depend if it's more of a maxillary, which is the upper jaw area, or the lower jaw area, which is the mandible. The mandibular ones are typically, we can send home, they don't have a high risk for extending into concerning areas. We could usually start them on antibiotics, pain medicines, and make some follow-up arrangements for the, with the patient. Now, the maxillary abscess, these ones are more concerning because the infection can spread into the soft tissue, the sinuses, or intracranially. So typically, we'll get ENT involved, and they may even admit these patients that they look sick. Um, but this, the maxillary abscess would be the more likely the ones that would actually get a CT scan and look for extension of the infection. Now, Ludwig's angina is another type of facial or uh, oral type infection. This is could be its own problem, where it's an infection under the for the under the tongue, the for the mouth, or it can be an extension of a pre-existing like a dental abscess. Now, the concern here is what you see in the picture there, how the infection is pressing up on the tongue and it's pressing the tongue up and back, so it's possibly going to be cause an airway issue. These patients can look profoundly ill because typically this is an occult infection, which it does not they don't notice it when it first starts. It's not until it gets very, very serious and advanced. And sometimes the infection can also spread into some concerning areas, especially it could, especially concerning as if it spreads into the neck tissue. So it may have, you may have swelling further down near the larynx um, and hence the airway. Uh, and it can also go down to the neck and the mediastinum in some rare cases. And of course, that's going to be a much harder infection to treat. The physical assessment will usually show the patient looking fairly sick because by the time it's causing them enough symptoms to present to the ED, it's been there for a while, it's been brewing, it's been multiplying and building up. Uh, one of the giveaway symptoms is that the, the, the tongue will be elevated and possibly pushed 
push forward some, um, and the patient may feel like it's it's swollen and occupying too much oral cavity. The patient may also complain of trismus, which is that painful mouth opening, dysphonia, which is the muffled voice, and or dysphagia, which is painful swelling or difficulty painful swallowing or difficulty swallowing. Lab tests almost always will get a CT scan uh, to look for the extension of this infection. We may add on some other um, laboratory or blood draws also, blood culture, sed rate, to, to more document how serious the infection is too. Now this is going to need ENT or oral surgery to get involved. They do need to do incision and drainage. This is something that needs to be opened up and drained out. A lot of times with a concern for airway protection and managing the airway, they'll do this in the operating room where they have a more controlled environment. Two third dental fractures or avulsions. We're going to classify these in one of three categories of seriousness, basically how deep is the fracture. We use what we call the Ellis classification system. We have an Ellis 1, 2, and 3. 1 is the most minor. Typically, this is like a chipped tooth. It's just the enamel affected. There's not any risk for infection. Um, LS2 is going to be deeper tissue, so it's going to be the enamel and part of the dentin. There becomes uh, increased chance for infection with this because the what normally protects the soft living tissue inside has now been open and exposed there. And this should have some, we say, prompt dental referral to check for um, viability of the tooth and how it's going to heal up and if it needs some reconstructive work. Now, an LS3 is going to involve the enamel, the dentin, and it will be down into the pulp, into that living tissue. This is considered a dental emergency because the exposure of that living tissue, the risk for an ischemia with, not, with lack of good perfusion, and the risk of subsequent infection and uh, possibly abscess or a necrotic tissue there. So typically we'll get uh, oral surgery or ENT involved to come and see the patient. Now remember with all three of these, these are due to some type of trauma. So we have to make sure we assess the patient for other signs of injury, uh, other associated concerns, other associated pain complaints, things like that. So we may we may have to do more than just a specific tooth or dental exam. Some things specifically with the airway or the oral cavity is we'll look for swelling, we'll look for continued bleeding from some of those deeper fractures, or any debris, uh, broken and chipped uh, particles of teeth, for example, might be an airway issue. Treatment, of course, suction out if something's uh, causing airway issues. Um, you, Textbooks do say you can use calcium chloride or zinc oxide to cover the exposed area. This isn't something we typically do. If it's that exposed, we're getting ENT involved. And, of course, pain medicines and go ahead and start antibiotics, usually parenterally, especially for the LS3, due to the high risk for infection. Acute otitis externa, or AOE, this is basically an infection or inflammation of the ear canal, uh, the external auditory canal, more specifically, which is the EAC. And the from the cause, which could be anything from bacteria, the fungus, uh, to irritation, uh, could be from trauma. If there's a foreign body in there, or maybe they came to the ER and we had to take a foreign body out and we traumatized the ear canal walls. So basically something causes swelling of the ear canal, uh, maybe some abrasions inside there. Um, patient may complain of drainage. Uh, maceration is basically just a fancy word for sloughing of the tissues. We see that a lot with the fungal type infections that build up in there. Now, the, the patient uh, may complain of some itching or irritation from the ear or may complain of drainage. They may complain of it hurts to sleep on one side. There's not always drainage, but when there is, a lot of times it's uh, similar to almost like purulent drainage. Now, one of the things we need to assess for is the, the TM, the tympanic membrane. If the tympanic mem We need to see if the tympanic membrane is intact, because if not, then we may be dealing with a second infection behind in the inner ear also. One of the ways you can examine the patient and try and see if this is the cause as far as the external canal is the, the, get my pen here, the, the pinna, which is basically that portion of the ear there. If you will take it and if you will pull upwards, and backwards a bit, what it does is it puts some pressure on the soft tissue of the ear canal, and if the ear canal is inflamed or infected, the patient will usually report a pain response to that. The other way to do this is with um, the tragus. You can actually put pressure right here with your finger on the, the tragus, which is the little extension that covers the ear canal opening some, and that pressure on that area will sometimes elicit a painful response um, 
from the patient if the ear canal is infected. Now, if it's just an ear infection, like a, a, an otitis media, typically those maneuvers will not cause pain in the patient. The treatment for this is basically something topical, so ear drops we put in, uh, maybe an ear wick, which is basically just something that absorbs the medicine and draws it down into the ear canal there. So we'll insert this ear wick and uh, instill the medicine to cause it to swell and fill the space there. Otitis media, or AOM, this is commonly what we're treating here is a bacterial middle ear infection, so behind the eardrum. And almost always with this, you'll hear about some type of upper respiratory infection, either just before or associated with it. Whereas with the ear canal or the external otitis, there's usually not a respiratory infection with it because that's a local problem just for that ear canal. The otitis media is usually an extension of some upper airway issue. This is very common in the childhood years, up to about two to three years old. It can be recurrent. One of the most common presenting symptoms that the parent brings a child in for is tugging or pulling at the ears because the ears are uncomfortable. Now, the child may also be irritable and fussy. From the medical history, we'll hear things about uh, previous ear infections, which tends to increase the risk for future ones. Uh, if it's in adults, which actually otitis media is not that common in adults, we might ask questions about how they've been in some type of, or they may tell us they've been in some type of pressurized environment. So diving, um, otitis media can happen with that or make it prone to that. Or pressurized flying in a pressurized uh, air cab, uh, airplane cabin. The physical exam, especially in the children, because they can't communicate effectively to come in when it first starts, they may already be having signs of dehydration, running fevers from some secondary complication. When we actually look in the ear, at the eardrum itself, we'll notice that it's red, it's irritated, it's bulging, it's like pressing out. We may even see infection behind there. Now, sometimes it will rupture, and we'll see drainage in the canal also, but we'll see the rupture and the drainage, and usually the child looks sick as well. Treatment is going to be some antibiotics. Uh, hydration, because usually the child is responding with fever and increased metabolic needs, and of course some pain medicines. Now, the argument about whether we give antibiotics to ear infections or not, I know a lot of pediatricians are leaning more towards the watching and waiting, and studies have started to show that the outcomes are just as good. For CEN, for exam purposes, we're going to go with antibiotics to treat these. Um, that's the most common practice, the most universally accepted. Uh, years down the road, it might become more the standard of practice to hold off on antibiotics unless there's a comorbidity or another reason they need them. The definitive treatment would be the, the tympanic uh, tympanostomy tubes to allow for drainage through the eardrum, especially when the pre pressure builds up. Now, that's done by ENT, of course. Complications of otitis could be mastoiditis, which is infection of the mastoid, meningitis, possibly facial nerve paralysis or facial nerve damage from the uh, swelling and the infection. And, of course, we might get extension of the infection through the lymphatics into the intracranial compartment of the sinuses. Now, a tympanic mem membrane that's ruptured can be its own problem, like from trauma, or it can be as a complication of, like, an ear infection where the pressure is built up. Usually, if it's due to an ear infection, and then it ruptures. Usually the child is fussy and irritable, and then all of a sudden the child feels much better. But now they're having this drainage from their ear canal because the, the TM is ruptured. So a lot of times the pain resolves with it. And it's not really a painful membrane to rupture. It's more that the pressure has been relieved with the rupture, and so that's why the child is happy. Treatment. Um, of course, some type of pain medicines. Antibiotics, it depends on the cause. If it was an infected inner ear that ruptured, then they would treat the antibiotics. If it was due to trauma, probably not. One thing you can do is put some um, cotton inside the external canal opening, not to block it, but just to prevent more pathogens from going down into the ear canal. And we may refer to an ENT doctor for ongoing care. Typically, these are going to heal up fine without problems. There may be some scarring on the tympanic membrane, but typically does not cause de uh, deficiencies with hearing or balance later on. Meniere's disease is considered more of a chronic uh, disease. Um, now I put here on the slide that it could be episodic or recurrent, meaning it will come and go from time to time. Um, when we contrast this with labyrinthitis, labyrinthitis is typically just an acute one-time episode. This is, tends to be recurrent, and patients usually have already had this diagnosis made that they've got Meniere's disease, or sometimes they're just going to call it vertigo. 
Right? Causes could be repetitive trauma, could be post-infection, if sometimes if someone had a serious middle ear infection, which caused some damage or scarring to the, the balance structures. It could also be just from degeneration, um, just basically the aging of the body too. So typically this patient will already have a diagnosis. They'll usually come to you with some flare-up of the symptoms or worsening of their condition. And what they'll report as far as their symptoms is this vertigo is the most common symptoms, that dizziness, that off-balance. Tinnitus uh, could also be a secondary symptom with that ringing in the ear. Um, sometimes the vertigo can be so severe that they get nausea and vomiting with it also. Now, the workup, again, most patients will already have this, this diagnosis and we already know it, but we may need to exclude some of the causes that have brought it on or exacerbated it. So labs is appropriate, CT imaging is appropriate, especially if it's like a first-time event. Treatment is basically managing the symptoms. The most common treatment is going to be Anavert, um, which is an antihistamine-based medicine um, to help decrease the transmission and suppress some of those faulty signals. There's some other medicines that can be used also, uh, diuretics, steroids, anticholinergics. Of those three, the steroids are the most common one I've seen, but usually the first line is antihistamines. The disposition, these patients have probably already had some ENT establishment to make the diagnosis, so we'd probably refer them back to that person. When they're having acute flare-ups, we want to you know, educate them about driving, uh, machinery op operation, safety precautions, sedation precautions with the medicines, things like that. Now, labyrinthitis is it's a problem with the same body part, but this is considered an acute episode, usually a self-limiting uh, infection, um, bacteria, virus, and typically it's self, uh, self-limited and usually starts pretty sudden and it should resolve pretty, set, pretty soon as well also. Again, the symptoms are similar to Meniere's as far as the patient reporting symptoms of vertigo, but we tend to see this more pronounced with the head and body movement with those position changes, it tends to bring it on. Um, compared with Meniere's disease, um, it can actually affect the patient at any time, even if they're laying still in the bed. Uh, labyrinthitis tends to be more pronounced with position changes. That's one way you can kind of tell the difference between the two. And usually, again, Meniere's disease is already an established diagnosis. Uh, again, the workup, laboratory testing as indicated or based upon the symptoms, uh, and again, CT imaging as indicated. So neither one of these absolutely have to have this full workup every time they come in. A lot of times we can just diagnose it by their history and a physical exam too. A unique finding with labyrinthitis is these Dix Halpike maneuvers, which if you want to actually see them performed, you can uh, go on YouTube and search that, and there's videos showing it. I just give you a picture here showing that basically what we do is we're, we're basically moving the, the ear the middle ear semicircular canal, we're basically moving them through the three positions, you know, the X, Y, and Z axis, which helps tell us where we are balanced. We're basically doing that and seeing if we can exacerbate some symptoms. And what we look for is we turn the patient's head to the left, and then we do it again on the right, but we turn the head one way, then we have them look at a, a fixed object, like a spot on the wall. We rapidly lower their head, and we watch for nystagmus to develop. That would be a positive um, indication there might be labyrinthitis going on. Now, Meniere's disease, remember, Meniere's disease is going to happen pretty much with no position change. Um, so this is so you won't need to do this because it will be happening already. Treatment, if we know this is what it is, we're going to treat the cause. If there's symptoms of infection, we'll treat that. Um, we'll definitely treat the nausea that goes with the vertigo. Uh, sometimes, you need, sometimes these patients can be very, very sick from the vertigo. Virgo type symptoms, so we may actually prescribe medicines like Ativan or Valium, which have some, you know, of course, some anxiolysis, and they've also got a mild antimatic property also. And again, and also these patients will need referral either to neurology or ENT, depending on your clinician um, and what they're suspicious for or possible other causes. Peritonsillar abscess is an abscess not only in the tonsillar area, but also the soft tissue behind it, below it. Um, above it. Um, it's basically extending into the soft tissue structures and it's not isolated just to the tonsillar gland. The concern here is that you can't appreciate how much swelling is happening behind or inferiorly and you may actually be um, occluding the airway or having a possible airway, airway, airway issue. This is considered an ENT emergency and the infectious agent is almost, almost always streptococcus or strep. Now the physical assessment, you know, there's some clues to tell if it's a peritonsillar abscess or if it's strep throat. 
one of the first things we see is with peritonsal abscess, almost always just one side. In other words, it's not an infection that came in through the upper airway, went through the lymphatics, went through the glands, and inflamed both tonsils. This is one-sided almost always. That's the first clue. Another one is the uvula is actually pushed off of midline because the soft tissue is swollen in the upper soft palate and is pushing that uvula over. Now, if it's just a tonsillitis, if it's just a tonsil infection, that stays encapsulated just in the tonsillar gland, and that does not press on the soft palate or the uvula. Another thing we look for is this hot potato or a muffled voice. The fancy word for that is dysphonia. And the patient may have a hard time controlling their secretions. So you may see drooling. You may see tripod positioning. Um, also, trismus. Typically, these patients have a hard time opening their mouth very wide to be able to examine it. That's one thing you can even do in, just in triage. If they complain of a sore throat is tell them to open as wide as they can and say, ah, if they could open wide enough, you can see the back of the throat that's leaning towards maybe not a peritonsillar abscess. If they can barely open their mouth, may, you know, not even an inch, that's more concerning. There may be more of an issue there because it's using the soft tissue of the, the muscles that overlie the, the control of the jaw. And when they're inflamed, it causes pain. So this picture is showing you a good example here of showing you some of the symptoms. It's showing you the one-sided swelling, obviously, on the on the patient's left side there. It's it, the one side swelling on here. And it's also showing how the uvula is well off the midline. And you can see it's very crowded back here. We've got issue as far as airway goes. So this isn't a patient we want to go probing around in their, the back of their throat there. We may not even know how far, how far down uh, the swelling goes. Um, it may extend down into the hypopharynx and closer to the um, glottis as well. Now, most of these cases you can diagnose just by looking at the bedside and examining them. Sometimes we need to get ENT involved, though, and a lot of times they'll ask for a, a CT of the neck to look for the extension of the infection. The treatment, while we're either waiting for ENT to come deal with this patient or while we're working it up, we want to protect the airway, so probably raise the head of the bed, make sure your suction's working the bedside. Maybe if you want to keep your, your emergency airway kit you know, near the room. Um, go ahead and start some antibiotics and some steroids sometimes. That will help suppress a little of the inflammation. Of course, we want to get antibiotics in any infection, uh, infected state as soon as possible. And the disposition, well, it's going to depend what ENT decides. If they look really sick, they'll probably admit them. Um, a lot of times ENT will come in if the patient's well looking otherwise. They'll try and do an IND or an aspirate that abscess there at the bedside. Just be aware is this something that your ED can handle without tying up a lot of staff? Uh, are there going to be airway issues? What are your resources? Sometimes they need to do this in the operating room where they can control the environment better. Whether they do it in the ER or the operating room, a lot of times the patient will go home right away afterwards. We need to educate them about, again, aspiration and airway precautions. So head the bed elevated, um, have someone check on them. I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't recommend anything hot because um, that can increase tissue swelling, but warm is good. Warm will help to promote some drainage, too. Epiglottitis or supraglottitis, both epi and supra mean above the glottic opening, so some inflammation there. Commonly, this is in our uh, pediatric population. Um, and one of the giveaways here is the suddenness of onset, because what you'll usually hear about on the CEN exam is they'll compare epiglottitis to croup. All right, because the child will be sick, they'll have a sore throat, maybe a little drooling, but the suddenness of onset is what we usually see here. And how sick does the person look? Typically, epiglottitis is a sick child, whereas croup is a not as sick looking. All right. So usually abrupt onset, and our primary concern here with the epiglottitis is airway, because the glottic opening could swell and obstruct. All right, so again, a sick-looking child, typically onset within 12 to 24 hours. <clears throat> a child may have some labor breathing. They may be leaning forward on a tripod position, and we want to allow that to happen. We don't want to force them to lay back, but let them assume a position of breathing comfort. You may hear strider in the upper airway. They may be drooling, maybe not able to handle their secretions. One of the big things is do not go messing with that pharynx. You don't know if any trauma or anything cause anxiety or increase swelling may actually obstruct the airway. So we're just going to let that child sit and just do nothing invasive. And that even means, you know, if we need to, we're going to avoid doing blood pressures and temperatures, anything that would stress the child out, and definitely let them stay with their parent. One x-ray we might do 
is the lateral soft tissue neck. Now, this isn't going to be definitive, but a lot of times it helps clue us into what is going on there. And what you see is what's indicated by the black arrow, which is what they call a thumbprint sign. That's a, that's a giveaway word for epilotitis. So if you see something about a question where it says they did an x-ray and it showed a thumbprint sign, you just automatically think epiglottitis is present. All right, treatments, again, be very non-invasive if possible because you don't want to overstimulate the child. You don't want to cause the airway to swell up. And we need to be thinking about moving towards like the operating room where they can control that airway and be prepared for an emergency airway issue if they need to do an emergent intubation or a trach or some backup type airway thing. So this is going to need ENT or anesthesia or both uh, to deal with this patient. So you may even be waiting as far as drawing blood samples and storing IVs and stuff until the patient's stabilized. Now, again, croup will be usually what you see contrasted with the epiglottitis. Croup, croup or laryngeotracheal bronchitis is the fancy word. Um, this is not considered an emergency. Um, airway obstruction is very, very rare. I'm not going to say it's impossible. It's very, very rare. But this is more of a gradual onset. And this is the vocal cords. This is not the epiglottis. Uh, the vocal cords just don't swell to cause obstruction. They get inflamed. They won't swell up and block off the airway. Right. So typically this occurs at, uh, occurs at night. Um, the one they give away things is the barking type cough. The other pediatric thing that has a barking type cough is the pertussis. You might hear about that. So barking cough, low-grade fever, not drooling. They can swallow. They can control their secretions. The, the soft tissue of the hypopharynx is not swollen, so it's not discomforting. They might have a mild sore throat, but they're able to drink, and they look generally well. They don't look as acutely ill as the epiglottitis child. Now, if we're not really sure, you know, is this croup or is this epiglottitis, one way we can tell with x-ray is on this AP, or anterior-posterior, meaning shoot from the front to the back, um, we might see the steeple sign, which is outlined on the x-ray there for you. And basically that steeple, like the top of a church, pointing up, and that shows where the swelling is around the um, vocal cords, and not the. And if you did it lateral, you would not see that thumbprint sign we talked about. Treatment here, basically humidified oxygen. Uh, steroids, I put controversial. Some practitioners will still use it. Some will use racemic epi. Uh, just be aware that if you use racemic epi, it can wear off pretty quick and you can actually get a rebound type swelling and more distress to the child. So we should usually observe those ones if you have to give racemic epi. Typically not antibiotics, but again, ERs tend to overprescribe a lot of times. So it wouldn't necessarily be wrong. It would, you know, but a lot of times you don't know what the exact cause is. So, most times, it's just basically stabilizing the child, getting them breathing easier, get rid of some of the hoarseness, look for the causes, treat dehydration if necessary. Okay, moving over to some eye problems. Let's start with conjunctivitis, which is basically an inflammation of the conjunctiva, and that's the clear membrane that overlies the inner part of the, the, the eyelids and the lining of the eyeball itself. And basically, this is some inflammation that causes uh, this pronounced redness, the word is hy hyperemia or injected, and possibly discharged depending on the cause. Many different causes. It could be uh, trauma, foreign body, infection, allergies, anything that can inflame that conjunctival membrane. This is showing a very good picture here, just very angry and very red, very irritated. Notice, however, the redness does not cross into the iris, into the colored part of the eye there. All right. Common organisms when it's infectious is usually staph or strep. H flu is a possible one. And we can actually get a gonococcal conjunctivitis as well also. Usually this is by direct contact, so hand washing is the common way. Uh, you touch something that has a germ on it, you touch your eyes, you wipe your face, whatever you transmit, or self-inoculate is the word. People who wear contacts are more susceptible to pseudomonas. Um, so that should be one of the things you ask when a patient comes in with any eye complaint. Do you wear contacts or glasses? Because it, it makes it, sometimes they don't think to tell you that, and so you might actually have to ask. But pseudomonas, of course, is a different, difficult uh, pathogen to treat, and it requires special medicine. Neonates, newborns, they're at risk for chlamydia and gonorrhea from passage through the birth canal, especially if the mother received no prenatal care. So if an infant comes in with conjunctivitis, conjunctivitis, we need to get a little bit of a birth history and a maternal history also. Physical assessment, I think those pictures showed it pretty well. Redness, irritated, maybe showing a discharge or some drainage. Um, the discharge could be clear if it's more allergic or viral 
conjunctivitis, conjunctivitis, or it could be more purulent looking or infected looking if it's uh, infectious. You may hear about other people in the family or close contacts having some similar symptoms because it again that direct contact route. The physical exam, their visual acuity should be normal. Okay, now it might be kind of irritating because their eyes is inflamed to get a good visual acuity, but at some point, if we can get their pain down or some top line aesthetic instilled, we should be able to get a good eye exam and get a visual acuity. Um, the conjunctiva are going to be irritated, but not the cornea or the pupil, and the discharge may be purulent or clear. Usually, you don't need any tests. Usually, this is a bedside diagnosis. Sometimes we'll do uh, the the fluorescein stain with the woods lamp to see if there's a foreign body that may have been retained and caused an infection. Not usually, though. Interventions, again, we need to get a visual acuity at some point. That has to be on the chart showing that they have normal vision. Because if the vision's abnormal, that makes us think about other conditions. And typically, ophthalmology only needs to get involved if it's recurrent or if it's a severe case or if you think there's a more significant pathogen. Uh, herpes infection is one uh, that is concerning. Um, now, typically, we're not going to diagnose that in the ER. If we had some cultures that we did, if we swabbed some of the drainage, we might find out when we do, like, callbacks or whatnot. And definitely, we want to get them uh, plugged into an eye doctor. Uveitis or iritis, this is an inflammation of what we call the uveal tract. Now, what is the uveal tract? It is the iris, the ciliary bodies, and that's basically the, the ligaments that hold the the inner anterior part of the eye, that's your colored part of the eye, or the slurry bodies, and the choroid, which is the lining or the uh, the eye itself. Uh, symptoms, pain, red, maybe some swelling, some edema, increased tearing. This is usually idiopathic, meaning there's not a specific cause for it. One of the giveaway findings, and this is usually a unilateral problem, whereas conjunctivitis is usually progresses to bilateral, to both eyes. Um, Uveitis is typically just a one-sided problem. Not going to see a discharge. Um, what you may think is discharge is probably just the increased tearing or the lacrimation. One of the ways we can assess for this is you can shine a light into the normal eye, the one that's not having the pain, and when you do, it can cause pain in the affected eye. And the reason is, is because when one eye constricts, they both constrict. And it's that constriction or the movement of the ciliary bodies that are inflamed, and it hurts for the ciliary bodies to contract and relax. Another hallmark finding, but we don't, you know, this isn't something the staff nurse will typically do, is using the slit lamp, is you can actually see inflammatory cells in the anterior chamber. So just know that's the textbook answer. And again, inflammatory inflammation, you think itis, so iritis, or the uveitis. Now, without treatment, the inflammation can cause continued pressure to, to build up. So glaucoma can result, cataracts, dysfunction, macular dysfunction. Um, we do need to get ophthalmology involved. It, it, prompt is hard to define sometimes. They should be seen within the next day, though, by the latest. Some places, it's easier to get ophthalmology follow-up for these patients right away, or they can send them more to the office if it's daytime. But at least they should be followed up within 24 hours. This cross section is just showing you the, the areas we're talking about. Let me pull up a highlighter here. So we've got the, these are the ciliary bodies. These are the, the muscles that hold the lens. And what they actually do is they actually um, cause the lens to change shape to help focus. Um, and, have, and they play a role also in the pupillary constriction. This is the iris. That's the colored part. Which it'll, it'll uh, relax and narrow down the opening, or it will dilate and and tighten up the muscles there. So that's part of the uveal tract we're looking at there. All right. Because of the pain and limitation of function, you're going to have some decreased visual acuity, so we need to try and get uh, an assessment of that on these patients. Uh, this is a, one of those red eye conditions. And another giveaway symptom is this intense photophobia. They do not like light being shining in their eyes because when it does, the pupils constrict. When the pupils constrict, that causes those muscles that to work, and they're inflamed. They don't like to work. They don't like to constrict.
past medical history, we've seen overlap with some of these autoimmune or inflammatory conditions that people that get this from time to time. Um, it's not going to really help you make the diagnosis. It's more of just a increasing risk factor for possible iritis. Again, decreased visual acuity, uh, the intraocular pressure, so you might have to get the, find the tonometry pen, um, slightly elevated, and it's secondary to some inflammation and causing the swelling. Pupils, meiosis, okay, so this is a constricted pupil. And they, they may be small, they may be sluggish to respond because it's painful. Your provider should be doing a slit lamp exam on this patient to look for those inflammatory cells. And as the staff nurse is doing the visual acuity or the, the vision chart. And again, there's tonometry may be used also to see if the pressure is elevating some. Maybe for a scene stain if we're not sure if there's been some foreign body or if the history is confusing or not clear cut. One of the basic interventions we can do is control the environment as far as the light. Remember, these patients have profound photophobia with the um, with the ciliary bodies trying to constrict. So keep it dark. Let them relax. Uh, warm compresses may help. The cycloplegic agents, the word plegic means paralyze, so they reduce that ciliary spasm of those ciliary bodies. Okay, So they, kind of, they don't necessarily paralyze them, but they reduce the function of it. So it may, that may give the pain right, the pain relief right there. Now those cycloplegics, that's basically those dilating drops. If you ever go to the eye doctor yourself and they dilate your eyes, that's what they're giving you is a cycloplegic, causing your eyes to dilate because your ciliary, your ciliary muscles, they relax and the eye dilates open. And they take, sometimes they take 15, 20, 30 minutes to really work. So don't expect prompt relief of the symptoms, but the physician may order those to start working. Um, education teaching points, of course, sunglasses. We don't want them out in the bright light. Eye rest, and they should have uh, ophthalmology following up with them. And again, it should be done within usually 24 hours. Glaucoma is basically an uh, increase in the intraocular pressure causing damage to the structures. What happens is the junction where the iris and the cornea meet, it gets narrowed or obstructed. And the aqueous can't flow through there to drain out as the pressure increases. So basically you're plugging the hole and the aqueous continues to build up the pressure inside the, um, the eye itself. Precipitating factors. Um, a common symptom is, is where there's this increased pressure and then all of a sudden the pupil dilates and then it causes the angle of the iris and cornea to suddenly close down. Okay, So what we usually see here is a patient uh, may have been watching a movie uh, indoors or movie theater and then suddenly walks outside and their eyes dilated and then all of a sudden as the due to the change in the iris and the lens, it suddenly blocks off this area and it can't drain out and they get this sudden increase in this eye pain. Now, untreated blindness may, may result due to the pressure on the optic nerve and the pressure on the retinal uh, vascular circulation system. You may actually get ischemic tissue. This is showing you basically the glaucoma exerting the pressure on the posterior part of the eyeball there with the pressure going against the optic nerve and that back wall where a lot of the circulation, well, all the circulation comes in through there. And it's also showing you where the, let me pull up the highlighter. The spot. It's showing you here, this is normally the area where the aqueous should be able to drain out and to recirculate, but it gets blocked or it gets constricted and it builds up. And the pressure builds up posteriorly, putting pressure on the back of the eye, optic nerve, and the vascular bed there. All right, so the symptoms in the assessment, they'll have a red eye, painful, sudden onset, okay, and it's going to be bilateral, okay, most times bilateral. Uh, they may see halos, that's another word that might give it away, and the photo, the photo, it should be photophobia written there, photophobia uh, might be a symptom. The, the perfect, the most, the, the best test is actually to do the tonometry or measure the intraocular pressure. And we can see them as high as 40 to 80 millimeters of mercury. 
than normal is up to 20. Above 20 is increased pressure. Typically, if you be having that many symptoms, it's going to be pretty high. And that's one of the first things the ophthalmologist will ask when we call them for a consult is what's their intraocular pressure. The diagnostics is we basic eye stuff, visual acuity, tonometry, slit lamp exam, interventions. This is something that needs to be treated within hours. This is not a follow-up the next day thing. This is treated now. Uh, eye doctor needs to see them. Um, we can give them some medicines to try and increase the aqueous um, outflow and decrease the pressure. However, the most definitive treatment is actually go in there and open up that area. So iridotomy is basically allowing that opening for the aqueous to circulate. So it requires eye surgery. There's some of the medicines we may use. Um, so these are designed to decrease the pressure and to increase the outflow. We already mentioned about the cycle. Uh, you might use the, some of the cycloplegic also to allow that area to relax. Retinal artery occlusion. Now, this is these other conditions we talked about had some decreased in visual acuity. This is almost a complete loss of vision. Okay, and again, sudden onset. And it's think of the retinal artery as your coronary arteries. Like when you have a heart attack, you get a blockage and causes tissue ischemic. That part of the heart wall where you're having a corner, you know, where you're having an infarction is not functional tissue. Same thing with the eye. So as you get an occlusion, a thrombus, a plaque, an embolus of some kind, um, you get a sudden cessation of function for the area that it feeds there. One of the hallmark, not hallmark, but a, a symptom that's associated with this is called amaurosis fugax. And this can be like a, like a TIA, like we talk about TIAs are many strokes. A patient may have a TIA before they have a full one. This is like the TIA of retinal artery occlusion. They, again, they have a sudden vision loss, but it's temporary, and they may not even come see you. It's maybe a minute, a couple minutes at home, and it's when they come in with the with the serious problem, and you ask them questions. Say, yeah, I had this, you know, the week before, or something like that. Um, but that was like a mini stroke version of this. All right. But don't, I don't want you to confuse that with strokes. I'm just using that as an example. A TIA is, is like a mini version of a full stroke. Amaurosis fugax is a mini version of a full retinal artery occlusion. Now, because this is a blood flow problem, we're doing with ischemic tissue developing. You can actually get permanent blindness within a few hours. So it does need to be evaluated promptly. Medical history, a lot of the same risk factors for atherosclerosis show up here also. Uh, you see cardiovascular risk factors, uh, atrial fibrillation, uh, diabetics, you know, they have vascular problems um, with the integrity of their vascular system. Trauma could be a cause as far as dislodging some type of emboli that traveled upstream to the retinal artery. Now, when we do our visual exam, uh, they'll have absent vision or markedly decreased vision, but they can still pick up light. So, um, you might, they can still tell light or darkness um, in the affected eye if the lights are on or not. Uh, other diagnostics, of course, we'll do a full fundoscopic exam, tonometry, measuring the, that intraocular pressure, labs as indicated, depending on the history and the story. And we may even be thinking about CT of the head if you know, this could be a type of stroke presentation too. Typically, though, if it's just the retinal artery occlusion, it's only visual symptoms. You shouldn't have nothing else. You shouldn't have any hemiparesis, any speech problems. If you have vision plus something else neurologically, think more stroke versus just eye. Interventions, we need to get uh, ophthalmology in here to see this patient. This is an emergent problem, risk of blindness in a couple hours if it's not treated. Um, our ocular beta blockers will actually help to relax and reduce pressure in the eye. We may give some um, uh, type of diuretic like medicine to, to decrease circulating volume also, so Dimox is a possible option. Basically, we're going to get some, in, some eye type surgery and procedure to try and revascularize or keep the perfusion to the tissue there. Retinal detachment, and the retina being the lining of the, or the area, the back of the eye, where um, the, the light and vision impulses are, are consolidated. Um, and it's actually a layer of tissue lining the back of the eye, and it may actually separate or pull away. And what happens is uh, it's kind of like an aortic dissection where you get the tear in the vessel wall and the blood can go between the two layers of tissue. Same thing can happen here as the retina pulls away. There's almost always a tear in it, and some of the aqueous or uh, the vitreous can actually get down inside there and fill up that space there. And when it does that, 
then it's decreasing, it's obstructing the blood flow to the retinal, so you can actually get retinal ischemia. Now, this can be a common um, thing happening. There's a degenerative changes with aging, and it doesn't take a lot of um, stress or trauma to cause um, this tear in the retina to start to separate. Uh, it can occur in younger people uh, associated with head injuries or trauma. All right. The giveaway here is, is it is a sudden onset, but it's not a blindness. It's a progressive loss of vision. And what you might hear is like a curtain or a, a shade or a window shade coming down as the retina starts to pull away. The areas it's pulling away cannot transmit the visual impulse. So it's like pulling a shade down across the visual field there. And it may occur over hours or a day or so. You may hear about floaters also. Um, so again, retinal artery occlusion versus um, retinal tear differences already. Uh, retinal artery blindness. You can only see light or dark uh, and blindness, sudden onset. Here on the retinal attachment, you see floaters possibly in this shade being pulled down. The physical exam will usually show the pupil being normal, um, maybe some alterations in the visual field, so maybe a certain area if you, I know usually a staff nurses, we just do a basic eye chart exam, but if we were to check their visual quadrants, you might notice a defect in one of the quadrants, and that's the area where the retina was being affected there. Um, our providers, mid-levels, usually do fundoscopy, which is looking at the back of the eye, slit lamp exam, and checking that tonometry as well, too, for that pressure, make sure it's normal. Now, this does, now I put here emergent uh, ophthalmological consultation. Again, this might be, if it's in the daytime, they might tell you to send them over to their office. They might come and see them. Um, even while we're waiting, we do want to shield both the eyes because any eye movement could stimulate that retina to detach more. So they'll need a driver. They'll need someone to be with them because we're essentially going to make them temporarily blind because we want to reduce any movement or action there. Corneal abrasion, so this is a lot more common. You probably deal with these on a daily basis in most ERs. Basically, the, the epithelium or the, the outer lining of the cornea, which is considered a type of dermis, is gets abraded, scratched, um, torn. Uh, commonly, it's foreign bodies, you know, eyelashes, uh, sand, metal fragments. Um, could be contact lens wearing, especially if they don't change them out or clean them. It can cause erosions. And then we deal with the ultraviolet or the flash burns, the welder's burns. It actually cause damage, almost like um, uh, first degree, like sunburns to the skin on the cornea. Okay. Now, the, one of the problems with the cornea is it doesn't heal up as quickly as like your skin does because it doesn't have that strong vascular bed. Uh, so it has to grow just by making new skin cells rather than trying to heal it. Um, and it may take a while sometimes. The physical assessment, you'll hear the history of, of something getting in the eye or some exposure. Most times the patients can tell you when it started, what they were doing. Um, you'll hear about maybe they were doing like um, woodworking or in a metal shop or doing something with tools and they didn't have eye protection on or, you know, cutting the grass, things like that. And their symptoms will be some type of pain, irritation, the eye may be red, sensitive to light. Uh, common symptoms, we should not see any infectious drainage. We should see pupils working. Um, and it usually is just one side. Um, you, could you get a bilateral? Well, if, more often with the chemical or, the, or with the ultraviolet or the flash burns, yes. But if it's like a foreign body, it should just be one-sided. All right. They may be having a lot of tearing or lacrimation. Um, somebody needs to, at some point, evert or flip over their eyelids to make sure there's not a foreign body under there. And that's easy to do once we put those anesthetic drops in there. We're going to check their visual acuity. It should be normal. Now, remember, if you're checking their visual acuity and they don't have good pain relief, it's going to be hard to get a good exam. So sometimes even just waiting a little bit to put the topical anesthetic in there will help get a better visual exam on them. And we're going to use the um, fluorescein or some type of stain to um, look under the woods lamp or that black light and see there's areas that are showing uh, irregularities, which would be the abrasion or the trauma. Uh, the clinician will do a slit lamp exam, uh, which also will look at the anterior chamber for defects there. Uh, current treatments are kind of 50-50 as far as eye patching. Uh, remember I told you that it's avascular, which means it doesn't get a lot of good oxygen to the cornea. So if we were to patch it, which means closing the eye, a lot of times it doesn't get good healing properties. So it's 50-50. Hopefully you won't see a question asking if you should patch the eye or not. Uh, if you do, I would lean towards not patching it as the appropriate thing to do.
your ophthalmic anesthetics, that's your um, tetracaine, alkane, whatever product you're using, that's those numbing drops, um, which will give you that quick relief, of the, give the patient a quick relief of the, symptom, of the painful symptoms. Um, if we think there's more of an iritis component, we might use that cycloplegic to reduce the ciliary muscles. And don't forget about um, tetanus shot. The um, corneal lining is an epithelial. It is an external barrier um, to protect against infection. And a break in that epithelium is also a potential chance for tetanus infection, especially if it was something that might carry tetanus, so something in the dirt, the soil, things like that. Typical treatment does not necessarily need ophthalmology. Uh, it would be recommended as the best way, but it's not needed in everybody. But basically, eye rest, uh, darkened environment. Uh, we want to give those eyes some time to start healing, basically. Um, if your clinicians aren't doing a slit lamp exam, then usually you usually can refer them to ophthalmology in that first 24 hours to get a full eye exam, make sure there's no other issues going on. Hyphema is just blood in the anterior chamber. A very good picture here showing you the front part of the eye inside that um, cornea there. Um, if you know it, if the patient's sitting up, it makes a nice little line there. It should not cross into the white of the eye because that's not part of the anterior chamber. So basically some trauma cause some bleeding from damaged uh, tissues. Usually takes care of itself. Sometimes patients don't even come to the ER for it. Um, if they do come to the ER and we notice it and everything else checks out okay, we do recommend ophthalmology seeing the patient to do a full eye exam. Now remember, because this is due to trauma, we needed a, a, what's the cause? Some head injury, some multi-system trauma, so we need to assess the rest of the patient also. The clinician will almost always do the, uh, a full ER eye exam, including the tonometry and the slit lamp there in the ED. As staff nurses, we'll check the visual acuity, we'll check their extracular movements. You know, in between the staff nurse and the clinician, we're going to, you know, check for other signs of injury that may have got us there. If this is the only issue the patient has to deal with, we're going to discharge them home. Um, an eye shield, which is not patching. Patching puts pressure on the eye. Eye shield is just covering it to protect other things from traumatizing it. Uh, elevate the head of the bed. That's going to help uh, increase um, some outflow and reabsorption. And we should have some ophthalmology following up if it's not resolving. A ruptured globe is considered an ocular emergency, and uh, it may require immediate surgery by the the, end, the, the eye doctor. Uh, this is going to be due to some penetrating trauma. Usually, uh, the patient is going to have some visual acuity changes, maybe some blindness in that eye, and just be aware because it's traumatic, we have to look for other injuries too. Uh, the pain may not be actually that much. Um, per se, one of the giveaway things we'll see is what we call a teardrop. A teardrop iris, which is right here. It looks like it's torn there. And you may actually see some of the aqueous iris coming out. This is the puncture here, and it's actually pushing or extruding out of, through the hole there. And that's why we have that trauma here, too, because it was torn. There's the opening, and so it's trying to leak out there. Okay, And you're going to compare one eye to the other, and they're probably going to look asymmetrical. Here's, an, here's another example of uh, the teardrop pupil again. And you actually see some of the tissue kind of leaking out through the puncture there. All right. So the the tests and treatments, you know, visual acuity, uh, maybe CT of the head, depending on the extent of other injuries. Until we get definitive treatment, we're going to patch both eyes. We don't want the eyes. Remember, the eyes work together. Anytime the eye moves, the eye works. It tries to focus. It's going to put stress upon that damaged tissue. Uh, elevate the head of the bed if not contraindicated and get our ENT involved as soon as possible. And again, manage those other injuries that are gonna happen also. All right, well this ends our presentation on the um, the ENT exam, I'm mean, sorry, the, the maxillofacial, the ocular, the ENT component. Um, a few other things you'll want to look for. I'm gonna roll, this, I'm gonna roll the screen back here. Uh, a few other things you want to study up on, on for the exam uh, that we didn't actually go over here. Um, check your facial fractures. Uh, that's comp that's uh, Most people have had TNCC. Um, if you haven't, that's highly recommended. Um, facial fractures, things like Lefort fractures are commonly on the test. Um, other types of maxillofacial trauma um, are uh, things that skull, uh, head injuries are covered in neurology, but I would say look at the skull, fra the, the facial fractures, the little fort fractures, look those up. All right, we're going to wind it up. Um, it's been my pleasure to have you listen and participate. I would encourage you to leave any feedback uh, you feel is appropriate. I like your comments. I like to hear how things are going. 
Um, hopefully, you'll be successful taking your test. And you can always get in touch with me um, uh, by email or the website or by Facebook uh, if you've got any questions about CE and stuff or about classes or other resources. And be sure to look at the other videos when you get a chance that cover the other sections of the test. So this is Mark Boswell. I want to sign off. And thanks for participating today, and good luck on your exam.